In today's video, I'm ranking the top 10 sets released of the year 2023. What's up guys, we are back with another top 10 sets of the year. We did it last year for the first time. I'm continuing it this year. We actually opened every set of 2023 just the other day. So if you're more of an opening fan, there's an hour long video right here on the screen. Go check that thing out. It was pretty awesome. Or if you like both, see what I think is the best, then go rewatch it and see did my opinion change? Because I did this list after I did the opening. So I did the opening, then I kind of researched and like decided what my top 10 would be. See if I changed my mind from when I made that video. But before we continue on, we have a giveaway. I'll be giving away your favorite set of 2023, one booster box or one box or whatever it is. Just like the video, be subscribed, turn on notifications. Let me know down below what was your favorite set of the year? And uh, was I right or wrong on the list? And tell me where I should have changed some of the numbers because I'm sure you'll disagree with some of it. That's how top 10s work. This ranking will be purely on collector's edition and by, when I say collector's edition, there will still be some consideration of the meta because the meta will you know, foster collectability later on in life. So like if you played like Dark Arm Dragon 2009, you might actually have liked it, which I know people didn't like that format, but it's just an example. You might love Dark Arm Dragon now, you know, so you want to collect Dark Arm Dragon because you played it. So people playing, you know, tier laments or whatever they're playing right now may want to collect that in the future, like the original prints. But there is a heavier emphasis on the collectability, like currently as well as long term versus other top tens. You'll probably see mostly like how good it was, how good the cards were inside. Could you play them? Are they good for like you know casual play or whatever this has that factored in but not nearly as much just to give it a little bit of a difference from the top tens you would normally see but before we get started in the actual top 10 we have the stinkiest set of 2023 back in 2022 it was hidden arsenal chapter one an absolutely disgustingly bad set the best card in the set was like four bucks at the time it was a weird reprint set of cards that people really didn't need everyone was confused when it came out it also has kind of a re weird rarity a lot of people don't like so very weird this year, a little bit harder to choose. It wasn't so obvious that it was like, wow, that was an absolute stinker. I know you're probably thinking of one set, which hilariously wasn't my first thought. So my first thought actually was the Yu-Gi-Oh! Masterpiece Series Platinum Dark Magician, which we've, we've hated on a little bit on this channel, a $1,300 card, which you might say, wait, that's not a set. That's why it's not gonna win the award. But I did wanna mention that we had the Master, Master Please Platinum Dark Magician, which you can still buy down here. So yeah, it's still available because a thousand copies was way too many. Nobody really wanted this. Unfortunately, it can't win stinkiest set of the year because it's only one card. So we have to go on to a different set. And you probably did guess this. It's Legendary Duelist Soul Burning Volcano, which compared to Hidden Arsenal Chapter One, this set looks great because it has actually a couple of cards that aren't terrible. While this set was stinky, sucky, and overall atrocious, it was much better than 2022's stinky award winner, the Hidden Arsenal Chapter One. The Ghost Rare Sunlight Wolf holding decent value as well as a $20 ultra rare card, and of course the niche but beloved volcanic support, this set at least had a couple of cards someone might want to collect. So just having a couple of nice cards puts this well above and beyond Hidden Arsenal Chapter One last year. So while it is the stinkiest set of the year, it isn't as stinky, so I will give Konami props. There wasn't a set as bad in his Hidden Arsenal Chapter One this year, though there was the Platinum Dark Magician so I can't really clap too hard. That brings us to the number 10 set of the year. So I will say there are 12 actual releases in terms of booster boxes. I clumped all the 25th anniversary like uh, reprint boxes together into one. So there was 12 if you include those as one. And then there's three OTS sets and then some of the speed duel and stuff like that. I only did 10 here. So it's like 10 out of 15. So only five didn't make the cut. And I will say that two of the OTS sets didn't make it because all three OTS sets this year were pretty okay. Like there wasn't anything crazy in terms of collectability. Most of these OTS sets didn't have a lot of collectability factored in. So I kind of went with the sets that I saw were really popular at the time and they will probably become collectible later. The tournament pack I picked, there was 21, 22, and 23. I went for OTS 21 as a representative for OTS this year, containing Cash Tier Fenrir, Sprite Blue, and Tier Elements Rhino Heart. It's three different archetypes that all had a really big card printed in ultimate rare and while they're not collector friendly right now probably i'm sure someone who loved the sprite deck in five to ten years will want to come back and collect this ultimate rare sprite blue because they're like i remember that was an awesome card when it first came out in secret rare got the ultimate rare print i want to get that high rarity or whatever happens you know if you -Oh exist in 10 years this will be a card that they'll remember fondly and i personally enjoyed playing the sprite deck on uh master duel so yeah hate me if you want i know sprite i played a little tier limits not my thing uh cash tier i never got to that point i stopped playing master before that but i know these are big archetypes in 2023 so pretty iconic for the year and i think that this is the best represented of all the ots sets while it wasn't amazing i think it was a pretty good set now we're up to number nine which originally was known as 
atrocious defenders now known as amazing defenders the actual name hilariously we thought this was a terrible set when it first came out i always tend to err on this set sucks for collector rare sets but what happens with them is they start crappy and they later become better because the archetypes actually become meta relevant with extra support or just the uh, meta shifting in a different way this is one of those sets it started off as atrocious defenders it became really really good pearly did well i think makanko was pretty good for a while then they they crushed pearly so it kind of fell back down but even then, it's still a pretty good set. Pearly, I think, was pretty popular right off the bat just because it's the EV of Yu-Gi-Oh, some people called it. So it's pretty popular just in terms of I want these cards because I think they're cute. And that is something that could really translate into future like collectability because they're like EVs. Obviously, look at Evolutions and Pokemon. They're so popular. People want all of them because they think they're cute. Same thing with these Pearly cards. They're very similar. They're the Yu-Gi-Oh version. I can see that becoming popular in the future or continuing to be popular because they are right now. And then, of course, our favorite card was the Card Trooper and we went out and found it, you know, I pulled a bunch. It didn't take that long. It was like two cases. So it's like two cases to get it. But it is a somewhat collectible card because of Edison and stuff. It's not the best. I mean, when it comes to like having a super collectible card, this is not really the set, but it at least has something from an old school format that was kind of cool. At number eight, we have another collector rare set, which you'll see a trend collector rare sets mostly going in a row here. We have Wild Survivors, which I did actually like a lot of the cards in this set because Wild Survivors the hungry burger the hungry burger was extremely awesome and exciting when it came out I mean, a lot of people remember the hungry burger from back in the day which made this set i mean a clear choice for a collectible set because you want to collect the new hungry burger collector rare as well as the archetype based around it so you can actually play hungry burger sort of in your deck and not only that this set had some pretty good stuff like the dino support which dinos i would consider a collectible archetype because they've been popular for so long so dinosaurs while also fairly competitively viable right now and very competitively viable a couple years ago. They're also pretty cool to collect. Like who doesn't want to collect dinosaur cards, especially if you played them and won them in tournaments and locals, whatever it is. And finally, the third archetype, the Vanquish Soul, wasn't bad either. So there's actually a pretty solid base here in terms of like good cards, collectible cards. The main issue here is it's a collector rare set and they're just not fun to open. And that takes away a lot of value from collectors because not everyone's a sealed collector. They want to open stuff up and pull stuff. And this is just not a great set to do it. So while it is at number seven, it's one of my favorite sets. It's just really hindered by the setup of the actual set itself. While hindered by the collector rare sets, still a solid set at number eight and honestly a pretty strong number eight. Let's go on to number seven. Number seven is one that was actually really hard for me. Seven and eight were so, so close because they're both collector rare sets. They both have something going for them in terms of old school reprinted cards actually getting an archetype. Here, it was the Gay Guardian and the Gay Guardian support. Personally, I thought those were both awesome. Hungry Burger versus Gay Guardian. The really small advantage here is that this set actually contains some pretty nice cards like Solemn Judgment Collector Rare is really a really good print. It's the first time I've ever been printed in Collector Rare. Super Rares are pretty accessible. They're like $2 each. Then there's a $30 Ultra Rare Excel Synchro Stardust Dragon, which is really good. Woke Up Your Elemental Hero Collector Rare is pretty collectible. Guardian Chimera is in here. Baron was huge. Of course, it got the reprint seven times in Rarity Collection, so that really hurt this. But still, a, a good print, Collector Rare Baron cheaper Baron available in the ultra rare. So there's a lot in terms of like big cards available. I didn't even mention the Black Cluster Soldier. That's pretty collectible. The actual archetypes do not hold up as well as they did in Wild Survivors. Like there were three awesome archetypes here. It's more like eh, it's kind of iffy in terms of the archetypes. So it's more big cards versus archetypes. And I went with this because I think Gate Guardian's slightly better than Hungry Burger. Hungry Burger's Mimi. Gate Guardian is just really cool. But I could be wrong. I could be convinced to flip those two. I think they're very, very similar and very good. And obviously in here, there's a lot of cool cards that you would actually one if you take a look i mean wake up your elemental hero and two prints i mean there's just good stuff these are very similar and very awesome both being held back by being collector rare sets at number six we are getting into the core sets so we have photon hypernova while it is not co as collectible really as the previous two sets it does have a huge advantage and that is it not being a collector or a set and being a core set, which gives it massive advantages over Wild Survivors and Maze of Memories. It contains original Starlights over QCR. So not only is it not a CR set, it's also not a QCR set, which I personally think Star Starlights are a little bit more collectible than QCRs. So that's something going for this set as well. They're harder to pull and they usually hold higher value because there's only five or six of them in the set. You get one every two cases versus one every three boxes. Or is it one every four boxes? I think one every four boxes. So three in a case. So it's much harder to pull them and uh, that makes them more collectible just in general. It also has a couple of pretty high value cards you can see here. So first of all, Triple Tactics Thrust, Secret Rare, 
over $75 is a secret. That's really big value for a core set and something you will never ever see out of a collector rare set because it just doesn't work out that way with the three ultras and you know, there's no secret. So the ultras are three per box. So you get more ultras per box than you do in a core set, but you get less pulls. So it kind of like feels bad that you only get three ultras, but it's also making the ultras easier to pull overall. It's very weird, very weird. I don't like it. I've already said it a million times in this video. There's also the big welcome labyrinth. Speaking of ultras. Okay, I said you get more ultras. I was comparing the ultras to secrets, by the way. So you get two secrets in a core set. You get three ultras in that. Not ultras to ultras because you can't do apples to apples because that's actually second lower rarity. It's getting confusing. But big welcome labyrinth is a $25 ultra rare in here. So two pretty valuable cards. And when you have a valuable ultra and a valuable secret, it makes it more fun to open because you could open it up. You could pull both of the expensive cards. You don't have to pull like two secrets to get like a crazy box. You you get two good secrets and a good ultra and that makes your box insane and of course one of the main draws in terms of collectability for this set is the mirror blade the ice blade dragon starlight rare so not being a qcr i think is a big plus unless they reprint it into a QCR, then it'll hurt. But having this Starlight Rare, it's very, very hard to pull, about one in 10 cases on average, because you gotta get two cases to get a specific Starlight times by five, because there's five different Starlights. That makes 10 cases, which is a lot of packs. That's 2,880 packs. And not only is it hard to pull, branded cards are just very, very popular. One of the most popular archetypes out there. So I know people who play branded want this card to bling out their deck. And in the future, they're gonna be remembering the good old days of when branded was playable. Remember back in the day when branded was playable? it was so awesome and my mirror jade was so awesome and that's why i still have it and i collect it to this day because i love that time you know that's what they're going to be saying they probably won't be old at that point but you never know they might be grandpas talking about mirror blade the ice blade dragon who knows but it is one of the best starlights we've had this year in terms of collectability so it's a very big one and there's also some other cool cards in here like the cash zero cards gold pride if you become a fan of that archetype that's going to do well uh tri brigade i mean we're getting to that point remember back in the day when tri brigade was yeah we're getting there we're getting there moving on to our top five we have battles of legend monstrous revenge last year the battles of legend set which i think was crystal revenge did really well because it had exodia it had all these really cool ones like access code talker in there this year's was definitely a little bit less exciting i still have it at number five so it's still a pretty good set but this was majorly like you get a qcr or it's a bust on the set in terms of value while there was some good cards in here in reprints a lot of them got reprinted again in rarity collections so not great but there really isn't a lot of good secrets to pull i think the best one if we go look down here i think was zeus around 20 bucks 17 bucks something like that where is it Okay, $22, so pretty good pull if you get the Zeus. I mean, you're pretty happy with that. It's like a 30-year box, maybe something like that. You keep going, Duality's 15, Sky Striker, Azalea's 13, and you go to five. So it's like, there's three cards. And if you guys remember, specific, I post these on my Twitter after I do these case openings. This was a really hard pull. Like these cards, I don't think Zeus was as bad actually, but Azalea, actually maybe it was. I'm getting confused, but I remember Azalea being actually harder to pull for me than a quarter century secret rare. Just if you get any quarter century secret rare, you pull that before you pull an Azalea slightly. So it was that hard to pull a $13 card. So the value in here was pretty tough. Like it was like you were getting some good cards. Like you could pull Super Poly in here, which was pretty nice as a secret. I mean, there's some good stuff like the rights, you know, the Brave Package, the, a, a lot of cards that you actually do want. So if you're like opening to like build decks, could work out pretty well. But in terms of like actual value, not great. The good side is there was a lot of collectible cards in here. So first of all, we have stuff like, I mean, Zeus, I think has reached point of collectability, though I will mince, I will talk a little bit later. This and the IP Masquerina, of course, were reprinted Starlight. So a little bit iffy there, but really cool things like terraforming. That's pretty awesome. Dark Arm Dragon was a pretty awesome one. Quarter Century Dark Hole. I didn't even remember this one until I was doing the research. I was like, Dark Hole got a Quarter Century. I don't think I ever pulled it. Pretty collectible there. We have stuff like Madolce Queen Tiramisu, like Madolce's pretty awesome print for stuff like that. Danger Nessie, just some really cool stuff. Dark Magician, the, the Knight of Dragon Magic, which I always call the Gaia. I never pulled it, but talk about old school and throwback. It's a mixture of Dark Magician and Curse of Dragon. It's really awesome. Then there's stuff like Arm Neos for elemental hero fans. I mean, there's a lot of really, really cool stuff in the QCR section. The problem is you have to pull one every four boxes, so it's pretty hard to actually get one. Then you have to pull from 25 of them, so you probably end up getting something like the Spiral Quick Fix when you don't want that card. So, you know, it, or maybe even the Xtox Hydra. Who knows? Very collectible. If you're a fan of Ruxin Sag moments, then you will love this card because we pulled 17 of them. So overall, it's a weird set. And then the fact that the best card in the set is a Starlight reprint, which a lot of people just don't like saying that they're reprints of Starlights because they're not the same. But while they are not the exact same cards, they are very similar. They're high rarity. They look similar. And there was already that 
high rarity chase in another set. So having this as the top card makes it weird. Like I don't feel as bad about Zeus because it's the fourth best card. It's like, OK, there was already a Zeus, but this isn't the top card. Like if Lubelion was the top card, I feel like that psychologically would make me like the set more because Lubelion didn't have a quarter century secret. And I think it's a really good card in here. And it's actually exclusive to only the QCR slot, which I think is really cool. The IP being at the top is just kind of weird for me, because like if I want the IP Mascarena high rarity, I want to go to Chaos Impact and it feels a little strange. So I feel like that plus the not great value in here makes this you kind of bumped it up a little bit on the rankings to number five instead of maybe making it to four or three. Let me know what you think about this set in general. I found it really conflicting for me. It's a good set, but it's also a little weird. And speaking of weird sets, at number four, I have Cyberstorm Access, a set that I basically forgot about all year until I was doing this research. And I was like, oh, I remember that that set came out. Whoa! This set is insane. And while you might be like, well, what is insane about it? There's nothing collectible. There is almost zero collectible in here at the moment. But the crazy part about this set is that the prices in here are absolutely nuts. And it also has the Starlights over QCRs, which I consider slightly better in my opinion. So if we just go check it, I'll just check out this price guide. It is absolutely crazy. So yeah, we got Starlights, yada, yada. Chaos Angel, $70. I originally thought this said 89 so that made it a little bit more exciting so but still 70 dollar card really big one of the most expensive secrets we have all year that you know because it hasn't been reprinted yet keep that in mind once it gets reprinted the set you know goes way down in the rankings but we're doing current moments so we can come back and watch this in 2025 maybe re-rank them that'd be kind of a fun video in the future 2025 ruxin when you're re-watching this there's an idea i'm gonna love myself for that i'm just gonna go ahead and say that uh, then we have the $53 Guiding Quim. So we've got a $70 and a $50 plus dollar Secret Rare right off the bat, which is crazy. I mean, Secret Rares being over $50 is always insane. Then here's the one that I was really like, whoa. Bestial Dispater, however you say this, Dispater, Dispatcher. I don't know how to say that. $38, it's an ultra rare. So we have a nice ultra, like really nice, almost $40. A couple of huge secrets. There's some other ones that are not as huge, but I mean, $18 secret, 18. I mean, there's some really nice stuff. Ultras, uh, eight bucks here. Ice Jade, actually a good card, pretty crazy. So a set like this is just fun to open because you spend 60 and you can actually make more than 60, which doesn't happen often in Yu-Gi-Oh sets. Like in theory, let's just say we open up a box. Best case scenario, we pull the Guiding Quem Starlight Rare. That's amazing. We also pull Chaos Angel. We also pull the Secret Rare Guiding Quem. Right now we're at 70, we're at 123, plus this, which is what? $286 plus cents and all that. Then if we pull this in the Ultra Rare, it'd be a $300 box. That potentially could happen. And if you even take out the Starlight Rare, you're at $150 box you paid 60 for, which is absolutely insane. And while it probably won't happen, just having that potential makes opening really fun. Because if you're opening something and the best you can possibly do is pull $30 worth of value, it's not that fun, especially if you're actually looking for cards in here. Like you're like, OK, I'm opening this up. I want to get uh, some of the bestials in here, the despians for my deck, etc. And then if I pull big money cards, it's just a bonus on top. That makes this a very fun set to open up. So that is why I have this thing at number four. This is one that I didn't expect to be so high. And I think with the value inside, it's pretty exciting opening for collectors. And don't let those sealed collectors convince you that they don't like to open stuff, too. They have to open stuff like this so they don't open their expensive boxes. So they really like this kind of set. And speaking of insane prices, Age of Overlord, you knew it was going to be in here. Oh my goodness, this is an insane set when it comes to value. Like, I remember this one being good, and I knew it was going to be up in the top five for sure. I went back and looked. These prices have got even crazier. The one at Seeker of the Sinful Spoils is $109. The SP Little Knight is $109. Two cards over $100 in the secret rare form. And then you just keep going down. That's not it. The Glory of Horus is $54, three cards over $50, two of them being over $100. I mean, you keep going down. There's more. Dia Bellstar, the Black Witch, $28. That's good value there. Ultra Rare, Superstar Slayer, $23. This set is absolutely loaded. Like, even down here in some of these other Ultras, like this being a $6 Ultra, this being a $5 Ultra at $3. I mean, like, okay, that's that's one of the sneak previews. But having three Ultras at $5 plus dollars is insane. Like, you could pull all three of those. You'd have $23 plus $5 plus $5. $33 in Ultras. That's half your box. Which I think this box might be over $60 at the moment because it's so good probably is like 75 or something like that. But even then, it's still a good amount of your money. We haven't even talked about the quarter centuries, which I said I don't really like them as much as Starlights, but they did it right in this set. They gave their best two cards quarter centuries, and they're both absolutely home run cards. SP Little Knight, 
$500 quarter century. The wanted, only $200, so it's a lot less than $500, but because it's probably a spell card and stuff. But you need a play set of those, I'm guessing. I'm guessing. I don't actually know that. I don't play the wanted deck. But if you need a play set, probably drives the price down a little bit. Well, maybe it would drive the price up maybe because then you have less i don't know i don't know maybe it's just because it's not a character being the sp little knight i mean it's very similar to ip very very expensive most of the time that's probably why this is 500 and this is probably just a normal qcr price of a good card but oh my goodness this is such a good set there are so many good value cards and yeah there's not anything in here that's like wow you really need this card to collect because okay i take it back magician of bonds and unity is a good card to collect while it is not like you know, it had the print and duelist nexus, which didn't make the list, by the way. So it kind of takes it back a little bit. But this is just a cherry on top. Like this one doesn't even have to matter. But it's a cool card. It has the yellow background. I like it. I'm trying to see if there's anything else that I missed. Dark Hole Dragon. It mentions Dark Hole. So that's kind of cool, I guess. Horus is a a new print of old archetype or whatever. They're kind of making it into an archetype. That's pretty cool. They're just good stuff. Labyrinth is pretty popular. The, it's just a good set overall like and i think in the future sp little knight's going to be one of those collectible cards even when it's not as playable kind of like ip is not as playable now as it used to be still a really expensive card finally we are on to probably the most controversial pick of the video i didn't put rarity collection at number one i put rarity collection at number two and this is no hate on rarity collection i know people are going to be angry because everybody loves rarity collection and i love it too i think it's an awesome set it was a home run konami did a really good job i just think number one's better i had to choose between two of the best release of the year and i i could be wrong honestly i'm not 100 percent sure that this is the right choice i had to make a choice though you have to go two and you have to go one one has to be better than the other in the video i could be wrong about it but you guys can let me know in the comments it was an absolutely ridiculously fun set to open i mean you're pulling seven rarities you're pulling awesome cards there's so many good cards in here it was super exciting the entire time. Players got stuff so easily. Like if you needed a place that ash, like you now have it for, you know, two dollars or whatever. Now it made stuff accessible, which is always great for people trying to get cheap decks and cheap staples. I think it's way, way better than Age of Overlord and Age of Overlord was amazing. That was number three. So it's absolutely crushing three through ten on the list. I think it's a, one of the best sets we've seen since I've been doing Yu-Gi-Oh content in the last four or five years, whatever, if you really count, you know, dual links and stuff like that. But uh, it's been really good. What are the negatives? It's number two. So nothing. It's not really that negative. But I do have a couple of points to mention. I'm not even going to call them negatives because they're not negatives. OK, one of them is kind of negative. The first one, people have noticed that the ultimate rares and the collector rares on this set recently, because when we first opened it, we didn't know because it was so new. They're kind of like you put them in a in a sleeve and it can like peel some of the thing off or like they kind of blur a little bit and there's some weird print quality to some of the rarities like especially collector rare and ultra i said ultra ultimate rare collector rare and ultimate rare those both have had a little bit of issues when it comes to print quality there's also the cases that are not giving out ultimate rares at all they're giving you extra collector rares i was going to do a video that jarvis jarvis sent me one of the boxes i was going to open it up on a video I accidentally gave that box away so now i can't do the video unfortunately but yeah they're, they're giving out boxes that don't have ultimate rares in them so quality control is kind of weird like you're not getting the cards you are supposed to get you usually get like three ultimates per box or was it four something like that and then sometimes you're getting the cards out and they have these weird splotches on them and sometimes you put them in a sleeve and they're not they're not doing very well in terms of uh, storage which i think will be a problem if you're like investing or collecting you know whatever word you want to use collecting the set you have booster boxes you're holding on to because maybe you want to open them in the future maybe you want to just hold on to them because you think they're going to do well if you maybe open in a year are those cards going to have aged poorly are they the rarity is going to be you know slimy or splotchy or whatever adjective you want to use for them are they going to be affected by long-term storage same thing with the cards if you're playing the cards in your deck and you have them in these sleeves and you try to take them out to swap sleeves because everybody does that for you know for a new tournament you got to get your new sleeves on is it going to like rip off some of the rarity or something like that it probably is from what i've seen which kind of sucks and then the second one, this is more of like a point versus a negative. We don't actually know how these reprints are going to affect like the market, which I know most people don't like. This is collector edition. That's why I can say this. But I know like the players don't care how it affects the market. They just affect they get cheap cards. Printing seven prints of 81 cards. Is that going to affect the market negatively in a, like a bad way for just Yu-Gi-Oh's future? That's something we have to keep an eye on. It hasn't been long enough to know and something that I do want to at least mention for the future of Rarity Collection. And I don't think it's actually a negative yet. So I just wanted to throw that one out there. The other one is negative, the actual print quality thing. So I don't love that. Overall, I think Rarity Collection was an absolute home run. I think they crushed it. It was amazing. I loved it. And it was such a good set and extremely fun and awesome content for me. So I, I mean, I can't complain about it at all. And I'm certainly not now. And because I put it number two, people will think that I am. But I just want to say I loved it. Rarity Collection was great. Let's go to number one. 
Finally, we are on to the number one release, which I bunched all of these into one, the 25th anniversary booster box reprints. And while some of these are not better than like Rarity Collection like standalone, LOB itself is the big one that I want to highlight. And then those other ones are kind of just a bonus. The Le they all came out in the same day, so I feel like it's fair to put them in the same release, right? Totally fair. Legend of Blue Eyes being so iconic, containing cards like, as you see, Blue Eyes White Dragon, Red Eyes Black Dragon, Exodia the Forbidden One, all the parts, Dark Magician, Monster Reborn, Gaia, Trihorn. I mean, all these cards are iconic and people that are coming back to Yu-Gi-Oh are going to want to get LOB. People who are collectors of Yu-Gi-Oh are going to want to get LOB. And then of course the other four sets. If you're a collector, you want to get all of these. And if you don't want to spend 2000, 3000, $20,000 on original first dead booster boxes or just original unlimited, then this is the set for you. Like they're right now they're 45 to $75 or whatever LOB is. It might even be more than that, but some of the other ones are like 40 and 45. So they're very accessible. You can buy them. You can open them. You can store them. You can keep them sealed. You can invest in them if you want to. You can use them as display pieces. That's what I'm going to be doing. Sorry, Chelsea. No, I'm just kidding. We're not going to be doing that. Or at least, well, maybe in my room, but probably not the rest of the place because, you know, Maybe in the future, I'll convince her. Well, I'll convince her. But this set is always going to be the number one set for collectors because it is the very first set ever. It contains those iconic anime cards, which Metal Raiders has a lot of too. Just saying, Blue Eyes White Dragon is never going to be beaten. And it's going to be hard to top, even with something like Rarity Collection, where it absolutely crushed it and everyone loved it. Unless we do a Rarity Collection Collector's Edition. I'm just saying, I never actually made my theory video about that. But if you do want to see it, let me know. Theory, Rarity Collection, Collector's Edition, I think could absolutely blow our socks off. LOB is still gonna be one of the most awesome sets ever and the best potential for like, if you spend money on it, you're not gonna lose money on it in the future, which is very important to collecting because if you collect stuff, you don't actually want it to be worth zero when you buy it. You would rather it be like, I paid 90, it'd be great if it's still 90 bucks when I try to sell it, or if I don't ever sell it, it's just nice to have it at $90, $90 which I think this set is gonna do well in the future. They'll probably do another box reprint at some point. They've already opened the floodgates, probably not till the 30th edition. So I'm guessing in year 29, year 28, these are gonna be pretty hard to come by even though they just printed a huge amount of these boxes so don't take this as financial advice don't gotta go out and spend all your money on legend of blue eyes because i'm not a financial advisor i personally though love lob in the booster box so that's why i put it at number one i know this is gonna be a little controversial for uh some of you guys but you are a lot of you guys are collectors so you guys will agree with me some of them some of you guys. So if you enjoyed this top 10 video, make sure to let me know in the comments. Make sure to tell me where I'm wrong because there are a lot of tough places I was probably wrong. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel for the new year coming up. We're gonna have some pretty awesome content coming out. Shout out to Tone Info Show, Daxter, Puffins of Doom, Ernesto Deanna, America Deutster, Leo Gwine 62, Brad KK Beats, Ananda Taisho, Ian Musa, Junior Barding, Robert F, Thomas McLean, Changalang, and Joey Castle. Thank you guys for supporting the channel. I'll see you guys in the next one. Peace.